Okay. It makes it easier for me, at least. Okay. Sir. Uh, where we started? We start here. What do you oh, mean? Okay. Uh, so first of all, there's a book by the military. I forget the author called could, Power. Could you speak up a little? Yes, there's a book by the military called Power to the Edge, and in that book they rail against private property in the military. These are the people who are trying to craft a new military based on squadrons, uh, active squadrons like we saw developed in Iraq and stuff like that. I can share that with you later, but. It, uh, you mentioned the other Marxists who uh, write about this. We only got their last names. Could you, uh, is there a way to get some of these names so we can look at them and study them? In what military is who railing against The U.S. military. The U.S. military. They're railing against private property. They say power is strength is a bourgeois attitude. They state that. <laughs> Uh, that is possibly because the military, from its own perspective, is the most socialist institution in the United States. But you wanted, you wanted, like Shaw, Calder, Goth, that, those are last names. Well, if I could remember. Um, you get it afterwards. No, I'd, I'd be curious. Yeah. All right, just a second. I'll see if I can remember. I mean, I, Martin Shaw, British. You you can look him up. Right. You know, online. You can you know under bookstores or whatever. I mean, he's written a number of stuff. I think it's Arlene Keldor. A woman. How is the last name spelled, please? Uh, Stan Goff, S T A N. Isn't he a cartoonist? I don't know, maybe, but it's not this guy. <laughs> Callow, I don't remember his first name, although actually I, I met him on uh, when I was in China. He is a British Marxist historian, he was also the director of the Marx Memorial Library in London. Pomeroy, I don't know. That's William Pomeroy. Man, I can't remember. Schwartz, I think his first name is David. Did you hear what he said, William Pomeroy? Oh, William, okay. The War of the Free. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. Thank you. Did he move forward? Are you asking? Him yeah, yeah, to right. Speak? I'm going this way. If you have, I don't have a question. Uh, you yeah, go ahead. if you're yeah. next, go ahead. So, uh, I have a book here. <laughs> um, first of all, I think there's no bad marksmanship left. I think that if the U.S. Army wants to fire on an enemy, that they will hit it because they've got all these fancy equipment where they will kill without missing their uh, object. Um, I want to know if you have an evaluation, an updated evaluation of Engels' writing. It sounds, all, all of it sounds as though you agree that it has pertinence for today and not correction so much, you know, uh, which makes sense as far as I can tell. It sounds as though we need to build leadership. I, I don't think we're going to convert enough masses in any reasonable amount of time. Um, but I think it sounds as though we need to work on building leadership, those people that are being converted by whatever experience that they're having. Let them know, or let us tell them, as much as possible, that they are the leadership that will carry the struggle forward. Um, I, it, it, it interests me, I've been saying for a number of years now, since I've been writing on schooling, that who we're talking to is also the uh, militia in the hills. 
the white uh, anti whatever anti everything militia that uh, that if we find a way where we can talk to them and say you want housing for everybody you want everybody to have security for food and health care so so we have all these things in common how do we build to be able to get those if we are ever able to expand that conversation sufficiently together uh, to bring that force of irritation that they have and our force of irritation together with uh, with mutual struggle um, I've been saying for years that we need to have the draft 30 seconds oh, because we need to unite people for the benefit of the people and uh, having the draft meaning we can send people to do farming and so forth that was done in the, like in the Cultural Revolution would be a good thing but it would have to be motivated by our idealistic objectives which is a good thing. Uh, yeah. Time. Move on. That's <laughs> just what I had to say. Thank you. It's such a great presentation again. Okay. Uh, I'm. I, are there, was there a question in there somewhere? Yeah, it said, do you have any corrections or enhancements to the uh, Engels evaluations? Well, the, right, the, the writers on military force, yeah, okay. do you have any corrections or expansions or updates? Well, the only uh, update I would say is that his ideas, to the extent that they are uh, foundational to Marxism, have to be applied to circumstances that exist in this country or other places. And so when you apply them, uh, you obviously have to, uh, what should I say, modify them to fit the situation, okay? but it starts from those principles, okay, and then it looks at concrete reality, and then it sees not how you make the the concrete reality those you know look like those principles, but you make I should say the. Uh, principles fit the reality. So there are some things that, you know, some things that he advocates in here, like um, organizing within the military, I said, perfectly uh, compatible today. You know, something that was done, and next, next time I talk, I'll, you know, speak in detail about that. We have to get those people that are killing Norma, you're them. finished. Yeah. Three minutes are finished. Let's move on. That are killing okay. them. Norma, please. I'm going to let this gentleman speak first because he seems rather anxious to go. Yeah, Al didn't finish what he was saying. Yeah, yeah There was a off. second thing, too, uh, towards the end of what you were saying. I kind of About the draft being meaningful for people? Oh, yeah. Now, let me just mention a couple of words about the draft as I, as I see it. I see the the draft as part of national service. Uh, I see it as universal, not selective service. Okay. And that um, if a person wants to be uh, to go into uh, working on a farm or working in a hospital, that's fine. Teaching by Except, okay, that we know that certain persons have certain class privileges. And they're the ones that are going to avoid the military part of it. Okay? Because that would be one component of national service, would be military. So my, in my grand scheme, Everyone would have to serve at least one month in military training. 
and they would have to be subject in the case of war to be called up. That makes everybody vulnerable. Rich kid is just as vulnerable as a poor kid. Yeah. That would be my stipulation, Fars. We have to have national boutique. service calls. We have to have boutique. Norma, please. Boutique meals. Show some no. respect to other people, please, Norma. Everybody, no, no, you don't. everybody will speak. We have to have boutique meals. Everybody eating wonderfully and loving to be in the military. Can we go on? Norma, okay, come on. So um, it's a little, a little louder. <clears throat> I think you said Ho's name once. I was listening pretty closely when you were listing all the contemporary recent people. Yep. And I appreciate that. Uh, whose name? Oh. Ho Chi Minh. Oh, I also did not hear Jiap or the number one guy that took over when Ho Chi Minh died in general, you know, not a, not a military guy, uh, L or something, I forget his name. And my question was, because, uh, as, I understand, as I feel about it, uh, uh, the uh, Vietnamese whipped our military, you know, along with international support and blah, 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 blah. You know. uh, so, and to me, that was a big deal. It was 50 years ago, but it was only 50 years ago. It was like yesterday to me. I'm still in, what do you call it? shock, you know, PTSD. And I wasn't even active. I was a dental system. What are you shocked about? I was vulnerable until I was drafted in 66. And lucky as hell, I didn't lose an arm leg in Vietnam. And I, a lot of my friends died and got hurt. So uh, my question is uh, specifically, because Jeff's been called the military genius behind the, the Vietnamese. Am I right? The military, you know. Yeah. So where does he fit in this? Do uh, you think he read Engels, a lot of Engels, some of it? you see what I'm saying? Or yeah, okay. added to the Engels uh, catalog afterwards, post Engels, for instance? Okay. Now, I, I couldn't mention everybody. I mean, I, I would have mentioned uh, maybe 10 others. Yeah, All right. Giap is one. Right. I could have mentioned Tito, which I, 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 I have just as high a level. Okay. Uh, but I can say in general, as far as I can recall, say those after Engels, okay, starting with the Russian Revolution on to the present, that they've all read some Engels, all of them as far as I can tell in reading their biographies, all right, to a greater or lesser extent, all right, even those who might have read it to a lesser extent, right? Have heard about Engels either in, in discussions with others, in lectures, study groups, or whatever. Okay, so he's kind of like well known, all right, among all those people that I've that I mentioned, um, and uh, uh, I mentioned Ho. Um, because Ho was uh, also a uh, uh, a war and military analyst, and who also was a obviously a practitioner. Okay, uh, I've read Ho's military writings, which were published in English, written by the Vietnamese His Military History Society. Okay, a huge volume of his stuff. I've read most of Giap's. I've read at least three volumes of Jia. Okay? And uh, so what I can say is that they all uh, uh, all pay a okay, thank you. all pay attention to Engels. They're familiar with them. Okay? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, First, have you read Frederick Jameson's An American Utopia? Have you read that? No. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you can't have a reaction to it. And then secondly, um, how does this fit in with what appear to be the purposes of warfare today, especially from the American perspective, that mm -hmm. it appears that war today for the United States is to go to some far off land to create enemies so that the, the war can continue on indefinitely and so that the... Um, 
military profit-making agencies, the corporations that make the weapons, can continue to profit from war, even though the war itself really has no point beyond their profits. Yeah. And how does that fit into your argument here about Engels and Okay. Military? You know, during Engels' time, the same thing occurred. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, war industries that profited off wars. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, it occurred in, obviously, Marx's time. It occurred in Lenin's time. Right. On down the line. Okay. So how, what this is designed to do, or what this idea is designed to do, was to disrupt that particular process. Okay. And he had certain ideas about how to disrupt that process. Um, and like I say, one of them was organizing within the military, okay, to to uh, 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 cause, <coughs> as, as he said, uh, to weaken discipline and to cause the soldiers not to engage in imperialist wars. Right? That's just as appropriate today as it was when Engels uttered it. Um, I also say uh, an armed nation has relevance too, uh, and uh, uh, if you had a, a militia that operated, such as in Switzerland, okay, Switzerland's army doesn't leave Switzerland; it stays within Switzerland. With few examples, some are in um, a few exceptions. Some are part of uh, UN peacekeeping forces, okay? but those are, tend to be very few. Um, so, yes, uh, we have a uh, war is normalized in the society right now, but. The way to breach it, if one follows Engels' notion, is to breach it within the military, because he said the soldiers are at the point of production of war, just like factory workers are at the point of production of production. Right? <laughs> okay? So you want to disrupt production, okay? You organize workers. To this, this, uh, you know, disrupt production to take it over ultimately. Same way in the military, you organize soldiers against imperialist wars, right, and refuse to fight in those wars. Okay, and the further and one reason why, see, one historically why uh, Marxists have been against conventional regular armies is because those armies okay, were more, how should I say, submissive to the uh, ruling class. And armies in which were composed of draftees, which again I'll talk about in my next discussion, are more susceptible to being organized against the ruling class, or at least against the wars of the ruling class. That is a problem. It, uh, hey, everybody in here pays their war taxes, right? We all support those wars. We have it taken. One way or the other, whether we like them or not. a little, um, how should I say, opportunistic, a little bit, uh, to um, support a universal draft in which, you know, people are drafted and they lose their arms and legs or they lose their head or whatever it is, you know, or, or yeah. they have napalm dropped on them or Agent Orange, yeah. as I recall. And um, it, uh, for the, as a Marxist, this is a really good socialist thing to have uh, I'm putting this out as an argument, yeah. which is, is what it sounds like you're saying, because it's it's sort of a socialized uh, situation in which you know all racial groups, etc., 
you know, and, and all of these differences are then socialized in a, a wonderful a capitalist army, you know, in which terrible things happen to people. Uh, you know, the First World War, you know, gas, uh, you know. Yeah, they, right. They thought it was the war to end all wars. Well, it wasn't 20 years later, you know. And, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to sort of think of this uh, in this opportunistic way. My aunt uh, was uh, involved in, in being a communist organizer for the military, but uh, I, I don't, it's like putting people in a situation that you don't really agree with because of the, the whole mentality of the military, particularly you know, in basic training where you get people so, sort of so beaten down that they uh, – are exhausted, sometimes they die in basic training, you know that whole thing. Um, and, and I think it actually starts in, in, in high school, in football, in which people crack their heads together. And mm -hmm. I used to write editorials against football because it, in high school because it led to the military, a military mentality. All right, I so, think it's part of militarism. Yeah, and yeah. Well, I mean, it's the beginning. Of a, of yeah, a, right. Yeah, yeah. Talking about to, to the you. civilian aspects of it. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, culturally getting them attuned to this. So um, I, I have a hard time uh, in terms of values of uh, thinking of, of the military as a socialized uh, uh, or, or sort of an opportunity. Would you please go away? All right. Um, uh, this is a, a social, a sort of a, a opportunity because it's a, a socialized uh, way of. Um, would you please? Come on, you chairs. Need to grab a few chairs for upstairs. Better take some. You mind if you take well, some? Well, this is disruptive. Okay, so I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, but it is disruptive. There's no choice. All right. All right. All right. All right, so that's all, all I want to say. You okay. Know, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, Again, if you look at this from a Marxist viewpoint, okay, from the historical materialist viewpoint, like in uh, Engels' uh, family private property in the state, mm -hmm. all right, was one time where there was no state, no military, where it was more or less of a communal society. Okay, that changed over a period of time through various transitions, and you got a state, you had a ruling class, you had a military or a, a body of armed men to protect the ruling class, which became the army, okay? And that has existed in every form of class society up to the present. You're going to have an army, no matter what. It's either going to be our army or it's going to be their army, okay? War is hell. I mean, you know, I was in the Marines, and I, you know, I went through all that socialization. But obviously, it didn't stick. But I went through all that socialization and everything. Right? But it is something which is going to exist. It's going to exist. That's why I said about your taxes. You pay for that military. All right. You pay for that socialization. Okay. It's something that exists objectively beyond your own, how shall I say, beyond your own subjective desires. The only way you can deal with that is to deal directly with the military. It's not just to change foreign policy so you have some wars and not other wars. Okay? It's to change the nature of the military and the nature of the class uh, structure of capitalism. Okay? So you're going to have that brutality, one way or the other. Okay? All Engels is suggesting are ways in order to either prevent that brutality, to control that brutality, and ultimately to abolish that brutality. Okay? But it's going to take a while to abolish it. In the meantime, you have to prevent wars or to control those that are in existence. One way to do it is to get the military or sufficient number of military on your side. A way to reduce it would be to have a, a militia which didn't leave the country or to have a militia which is composed of, say, like the people in this room. How many people in this room would, would uh, if they were called to, to go to Afghanistan, would go? 
Zero. You know, uh, the draft is just to get more persons involved in the military in order to organize the military because the further away you keep the military from the society in general, the closer you get it to the ruling class, the more the, the military is manipulable, manipulative, manipulated by the ruling class, as opposed to if you had a broader section of the population that refused to be manipulated, at least manipulated in a certain wars. You know, that's, that's, that's my argument. You're going to have a military one way or the other, as so long as you have class society. You know, that's war. It's the nature of war, unfortunately. Like the okay, I'll remind people that we need to leave end by 12.30, which is 25 minutes from now. That clock is incorrect. We still have several people who would like to speak. Okay, well, you, you answered most of my questions, but I wonder whether the, the fact that the, the character of war has completely changed, and especially in the last 30 or 40 years, we truly have a, a world war situation, not even a European war, it's a global war. And secondly, the, the, the development of nuclear weapons is important. And also the, um, the merger of what they call kinetic war with all kinds of other political forms of struggle that, uh, that the capitalists use. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't uh, see any distinction between, so you know, economic war, uh, propaganda war, uh, cyber war, uh, Etc. Uh, Etc. Et now inc incorporated under the rubric of war, that which was once sort of separated. A comment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree, one hundred percent. And I think I did mention that. Um, okay. It, under three, war theory and military strategy and tactics. And I mentioned that there were changing types of war. Historically, each mode of production is a changing type of war. Uh, and that is also correlated not just with the general mode of production, but with the technology in each mode of production as the technology develops. And as the technology developed today, you, you can have like cyber war, info war, all kinds of these other kinds of things, small wars, uh, wars that you don't even know exist, right. you know. Police, uh, police that's, it, but that, is, you know, in, from the Engels' point of view, you study war in terms of its development. And then try, that's in terms of also its contemporary development. Um, but, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I agree. You know, I mean, is there uh, something new about these, this situation that you could already, I mean, uh, what are the implications theoretically for this development? Is it a, is it a qualitatively new situation? Or? Yes. Do I think it's qualitatively new? Yeah, you know, how is it new? Well, well, probably it is qualitatively different, but what, uh, has anybody, you or anybody else that you know of, had sort of insights into that, or that this the new character of that, the war? Uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the persons that I mentioned yeah. okay. in here have studied that. Uh, Shaw, for example, Martin Shaw, has studied it, um, but um, has it made war into something that is, I mean, the ultimate uh, goal of war is, is to dominate another country or another people and to uh, change in some way those others, to control in some way those others. Um, that, whether it's info war, cyber war, whatever kind of war, non-lethal weapon war, whatever, that's still the purpose. Uh, but you have to gear your, 
your strategy and tactics to counter that in a different way that would, you know, approach. I mean, a lot, a lot of things, for example, in uh, contemporary stuff, like um, spying, okay, if I put it, counterintelligence, intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Before the CIA could, or the KGB, uh, could go to a, uh, a newspaper in a certain country, okay, that was sympathetic, and plant a false article mm -hmm. in that newspaper, right? And maybe in a year, it would pick up if if you were able to if it was disseminated correctly. You know, I'm talking about before modern technology, before the internet and all that. And maybe in a year or so, you might be able to disseminate that false story around and have certain persons speak more and more about it, right? And it might never be discovered that it's fake, or it might be discovered. Today, over the internet, you can do that in three seconds, right? Uh, you can plant false stories, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, that obviously is a change in technology, you know? So yeah, I mean, it, it requires, how should I say, uh, Keeping up with the times, uh, developing counter strategies to discover, you know, what's planted and what's not, you know. I, um, I mean, intelligence has taken a quantum leap because of the internet. I mean, uh, we all know that you can not just fake stories, but you can actually put words in people's mouths online. I, mean, I saw that done uh, when I was uh, making a uh, part of making a movie back in the 80s on uh, peace and we were interviewing somebody and, and they didn't say a certain thing and because and, and we, uh, we didn't ask the right question and the filmmaker said that's no problem and so what we will do is you ask that question and we'll show the person's mouth go up and down, and we'll put his answer. And we knew what his answer wasn't fake, okay, because we had asked the person, but he just wasn't available to come back on camera. And we'll just have him say that, okay? Now, you can do that and make it look far more realistic than a mouth opening up and down, you know, but you'd actually see, you know, the words being pronounced. Called automatic yeah. dialogue. I used to work in that business. <laughs> we only have 15 minutes left, right. so let's go move forward. Okay, so I'm, uh, as somebody who did, did not take advantage of the movement against the draft, I still identify with it quite a bit. And was interested in, in several ways. One, that I don't think that people are going in with set minds and then organizing in the draft. I mean, usually it, it takes place at people are 18, 19 years old, and they're making up their minds. And the military is very good and has very good uh, discourses about and uh, practices about how to get people to make up the minds the way they want them to. And it fails at times, but it, but it succeeds in big ways. One place where I liked that it failed, of course, was in Vietnam, where where we got our heroes of fracking that, that, that took care of it in lots of ways. Um, but I think there, or, and, the, and, the, and the movement, that, the military movement that developed against the war within, within, within the draft, as you were talking about hoping for, but in lots of ways that was people thinking the draft was wrong and done with them, not thinking that, that, that the universal said, that they were supposed to go there and do that, even if it was wrong, or you know, just that that the, the draft movement helped make them be in opposition to the war when they were in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, again, next time I'll, I'll deal with Vietnam, but I'll also deal with other cases going back to the 1800s, where you had mass conscription and how socialist organizations were able to turn. Uh, those in the military against then colonial wars and also against what was very largely in, in, in the 1800s. Uh, a lot of times, I'd say just as frequently, 
the military was called in against workers striking, called in just as frequently as the police were. And so they, they saw themselves have a, a double duty, again, refused to f shoot at other workers within their own country and refused to fight, say, colonial wars. And I'll go and give examples of all this. I mean, the, the 